today. It's really an, uh, an honor and a pleasure to be part of this first edition of it, Wish Africa Expo and also for the three of us to uh, kick off the Sunday program with you. As you can see, uh, some of our guests are not here today compared to the program that you have. Unfortunately, they had visa issue and so couldn't be with us. And I'm talking about uh, Azun Wagbogu and uh, Miriam Berada. Uh, but we still have the pleasure to have Seun and uh, Will, who uh, will be interacting with you. Uh, so just before we uh, get into the introductions, um, the title of our panel, A Home for African Art, I think was quite, of, uh, ins quite inspiring in, uh, in many ways for me when I uh, um, looked at it. And um, why is that? Because it first refers to uh, the notions of origin and of context and trying to understand for ourselves where we are from and uh, where do we belong, first of all. And I just wanted to uh, ask you also the question, just think for a minute, where are you from and where do you belong? Where is home for you as you think of it on a Sunday morning? And maybe we have a tour of uh, <laughs> and asking you where this place is. Uh, and I'm asking this question because in, in the context of, um, of the conversation today, a home for African art also raises an important question about uh, the history of the African continent. And um, as you know, last November, uh, the Fr uh, France was uh, the first Western country to agree and plan the restitution of 26 artifacts to the Republic of Benin. So we are also in the thinking process and hopefully in the activation of uh, a return of artwork from uh, the Western countries to their home in Africa. So all of these notions I'm hoping to, uh, to discuss with our guests today and uh, in the context of the project that they are currently working on. And let me first uh, turn to Sean and uh, give you a quick introduction of, uh, of his background because I think it's very important to know that. Um, so Sean, you are a graduate of the University of uh, Nottingham. Correct. And uh, you first started your career here in the UK with leading firms uh, such as um, Sir Michael Hopkins and Partners, Benoy and uh, Shepard Boston. You then returned to Nigeria as a founding partner of uh, INQ and you are now uh, the head of your own architecture studio called CISA in Lagos. What uh, really interested me in your profile, uh, Seun, is that uh, you've always believed that the purpose of architecture is to improve the quality of our natural and built environment. And this purpose that you have in your career, you, have, uh, you wanted to uh, infuse in the project we are going to talk about today. And uh, in addition to the willingness to build a community project, so what we are going to talk about today is also a community project. And uh, in your own words, you said that you wanted to get into a more public conversation about culture and history. And this is, I think, what we're going also to talk about uh, today when talking about the J.K. Rendell Center for Yoruba Culture and History. Um, and so my first question to you, Seun, would be, can you tell us, because now everybody wants to know about this, uh, this center, wh what were the foundational elements that you thought about when uh, conceiving this project in Lagos, in the center of Lagos? Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, can, can we have the slides pooling so I can talk through the slides? Yeah. Um, that's a very interesting question because um, when I got involved in the project, we weren't given a lot of time to think. Um, anyone, <laughs> anyone who knows Nigeria knows that everything has to be done in probably a third of the time that you need to do it. Um, so just to give you some background uh, on the project, um, the site is in Onikon. Uh, if anybody knows uh, Lagos, uh, the National Museum is in Onikon, Muson Center uh, is in Onikon, and so the site is right next to Muson Center. Um, and so the, the history of the site, um, this is a picture that was taken, I think, just at the turn 
um, of the 19th century, and it's of the Love Garden, which was a large landscape area stretching from where Mousson is now uh, to, to, to the marina. Um, and uh, along the marina, there was uh, boats used to dock along the marina, and uh, there was a lot of transportation from there towards Badagri or towards um, Ebute Meta. And as you can imagine, 19, uh, 18th, 19th century uh, boats weren't very safe, used to capsize. So there were a lot of deaths. Um, and there was this uh, doctor, Dr. John K. Randall, who had his surgery um, just on the edge of the marina. And a lot of the corpses used to wash up to the front of his surgery. So he went to the state at the time and said, um, can you build a swimming pool so Lake Oceans can learn how to swim? And they said no. Um, so he bought the piece of land, I think, west of this love garden and built a swimming pool in 1928. Public swimming pool in Lagos. Um, and so that was very popular. A lot of people learned how to swim, I think. And then he passed away in, I think it was 1955. And then some of his friends came uh, together and built a hall in memory of Dr. Randall. It's just very close to very close to this site here. So it was a very nice public area. Um, you know, in the, in, in the 1950s, there was a swimming pool, there was a park, and there was this uh, memorial hall which held a lot of art events, a lot of shows, a lot of culture shows, a lot of theater plays. Um, but as with many things in Nigeria, um, the place became derelict. Um, that's a picture of the swimming pool. Uh, I think it was in this picture was taken maybe 20, 2016. It was abandoned. It was derelict. Um, most of the park was gone because it had now been built up. <laughs> um, so you had offices and all sorts of uh, other functions. Muson Center built where the park was. Uh, and the, um, the Memorial Center was knocked down. So it was in the midst of all of that that we got a call. So we put a proposal together to... Um, renovate the swimming pool. Uh, we didn't think anything of it. We, you know, we passed it in, didn't hear anything back. And then we got a phone call one day saying, oh, um, Memorial Center's been knocked down. We need a proposal uh, for a new center and you have a week. And normally it would take us, I don't know, three months to come up with something. You know, so we went back to the office and we said, okay, um, we have a week to come up with a proposal. You know, what can we do? Um, and at that time, the swimming pool was on its own plot. The site that the Memorial Center was on was on another plot. So we thought, you know what, let's, let's combine them both. Let's, let's, knock, let's take the fences out. Let's try and make it as big a site as possible and try and create this outdoor space where we put the swimming pool back in, you know, because this was something that was there in 1928. So rather than get rid of it and, you know, landscape the site, we can still landscape the site, but have this, this public uh, element there and then rather than just replace the memorial hall, we can come up with something better, something more 21st century. So not necessarily a museum, but a community center with a gallery space, um, you know, because, you know, we did some research. There's a national museum across the street, which works. I mean, they get about 2,500 visitors a week, but it's, it's a bit stale. Uh, so we thought, how can we create um, a building that people will interact with a bit more. So we'll have the gallery space, but also interactive spaces um, as well. So conference center, seminar rooms, artist studios, temporary exhibition spaces, um, open offices, rentable space, gift shops, you know, rooms that can be used for functions that are, you know, tied into Yoruba culture, Yoruba history. And then the, his, you know, the site is very, you know, rich as well. So Island Club, which was the first um, members only uh, club in Lagos for um, for the British colonial masters is on is just literally shares a fence, and then Yoruba Tennis Club, which was set up in response to you know Island Club, is right across the street. Um, Tafar Balewa, who was prime minister at the time, his residence is across the street as well. So there's there's a lot there's a lot of sort of depth of history and richness that we wanted to tap into um, with what we're doing. 
Uh, this picture, uh, some of you all, who are old enough will remember Tales by Moonlight. Um, Yoruba culture is very oral, you know, and, and, and information, you know, through, through time was passed on orally, through stories, through narratives. We have always proverbs that, you know, parents tell their kids, grandkids, you know, things like that. So there was this program growing up that we, you know, that we saw, which was Tales by Moonlight. You know, old man sits, kids sit around him, and then they tell a story that's got some sort of message at the end. So we thought we'll tap into that. And the other thing we wanted to do was um, look at Yoruba culture, look at Yoruba language um, from a, a philosophical thought perspective. You know, because when we say Yoruba, instinctively we think about the, ge the geographical location, southwest Nigeria. You know, but the language itself is very rich. You know, it's got very strong philosophical, cosmological, mythological underpinnings. You know, um, one strong part of it is the religious side, you know, looking at Ifa divination, Orishas, things like that, which is not looked at favorably, you know, in the Southwest because most people are Christian, Muslim, were, you know, brought up to believe that it's fetish. You know, if I start speaking Orikis now, half the people here will start saying blood of Jesus or whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> on a Sunday, <laughs> you know, I knew there was a reason Allah put us on a Sunday, <laughs> you know, but um, part of what we want to do is demystify, you know, some of this. So this, you know, this picture is very interesting because on the left hand side, you've got Shongo and then on the right hand side, you've got some dude in a Halloween costume, <laughs> Thor or something, <laughs> you know, some Avenger, you know, but the mythological backgrounds are the same, Gods of Thunder. One is just nicely packaged, you know, and when you look at the rest of, you know, our, our, our deities as well, Oshun is the goddess of the sea, Poseidon's the goddess of the sea, Merlin and Obatala, who's the Ifa priest. You know, you, could, you can start to create these linkages where, you know, in Greek mythology or Roman mythology, you know, these stories, you know, have become folklore, bedtime stories, and the narrative, you know, some, a lot of our Orishas have the same narrative, you know, and they just have to be developed and understood and demystified and seen as not fetish, you know, and, 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 and a religion that can be looked at, studied, understood the same way you would Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, Judaism, or whatever else. Uh, fabric... You know, Oshun, Oshun is, for example, is one of the most prominent goddesses. You know, she's a goddess of the sea, fertility, beauty, aesthetics. And, I mean, I don't know how many of you are Yoruba, but you know that Yoruba people, when it comes to clothing, dressing, fabrics, geles, you know, we're very vibrant, we're very, you know, uh, colorful. And so that was something that we wanted to look at because cloth, Asha, speaks to identity. You know, he speaks to his place, character, hierarchy in society, all of that. You know, so we thought, and then he speaks to craftsmanship as well. You know, so it's one of the things that we thought we'd tie, you know, into the building, into the architecture through visual metaphors and whatever um, else. So just jumping straight into the architecture. So that's the site. Swimming pool site was on that side. The memorial hall was at the far end. So we knocked the two fences down, connected the entire site uh, together put the swimming pool back on, put some new pavilions in. Negotians like food, so they insisted on uh, a food court, so we said, okay. Um, so we put that in the middle, so that sort of connects the two areas. Um, and then with, with the building, what we wanted to do with the architecture was um, we didn't want a white modernist box because we felt you know, we had to respect the history of the site and we had to respond to the site. And so the idea we came up with was to have the building coming out of the site, out of the ground, you know, there, are, you know, there are all sorts of proverbs and Yoruba metaphors that we, you know, that we can orioke and whatever else that 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 we can look at. So the idea was, you know, have the building coming out of the ground so that it's not too imposing on the site, and we we wanted to situate it exactly where the old memorial hall was as well, which was on the on the curve. Um, and we wanted to landscape the entire site. So, you know, we evoked the old love garden that was there, you know, in the, in, in the 18th century. 
so we have, we have uh, the center, which curves along the left, uh, the food areas in the middle, and the swimming pool, wherever it is, and then the entire site is just landscaped, and then there's a little sort of village square where we can have maybe temporary markets come and open, or performances, um, or whatever else. And then that's, that's the view from the street. If you remember the, the last image of the fabric, so what we did was we've got the building clad in terracotta, so the entire building is clad in terracotta. We couldn't make it out of adobe because the adobe couldn't take the weight. So we had to make it out of concrete and then clad in, clad in finish it in terracotta. Um, and then, so we've got glass at the bottom and then it's solid at the top. So the glass, for example, uh, it's not tinted, it's completely clear. But what we've done is we've frosted all the names of the major Yoruba towns and villages on the glass, so nobody can come and say that their village is not represented. Because <laughs> you know what people are like. Um, and, then, and then the screen at the front, you know, sort of evokes that spirit of craftsmanship. And, you know, so you can see it in, in, in weaving, basket weaving, hair plating, even in, in, in the fabric, how I, sh how I showcase you know, put together, you know, so we have all these, you know, little visual metaphors where, you know, the idea is if you don't understand, you know, the language, the culture, the history, you can come into the center, you can go through it, you can learn about, you know, these philosophical um, side of it, the art, how, the, how our art differs from Western art or, and this is Yoruba art now, how it differs from Bini art or whatever else. And then through the building itself, second time you look at the building, you can start to see you know some of some some of these things. Yeah, because you you mentioned also when we we talked that this wouldn't be a kind of a linear presentation of yes. uh, of the culture yes. and maybe something that we can also discuss with we later. But this will not be like uh, fixed yes, or it's not, linear yeah. presentation mm -hmm. huh? of. Uh, so it's almost content. done. I mean, this is where we are uh, currently. Uh, so most of the structures done, or about eighty percent, um, things don't move as quickly as they should in Lagos. Um, but we're, we're making some progress. We're hoping we should finish by, I don't know, second quarter next year. Um, but the building's taking shape, the architecture's taking shape. The next step after this is we paint and then we start working on the interior. Um, and then these are some shots of the interior. There's a video that will show the interior, but so what we've done internally is, even though it's even though it's linear, it's or even though it's chronological, we didn't want a linear uh, route through. Uh, so what we did was we created five pavilions, well five shrines, but pavilions for people that don't like the word shrine. <laughs> it's a Sunday, <laughs> um, so we created five pavilions. Um, looking at, so the first one looks at the creation story, and there are a number of creation stories, but this was one that we picked on. So I think, Will, you can talk about the creation story more uh, when we go on. Um, but yeah, there's, 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 a really, there's a very interesting story, you know, about this. I'll, I'll, I'll let Will talk about the detail, but, you know, it's about, uh, what's his name, Olodumare, the supreme being, wanted to create the earth, so he sent... Um, parts of his matter, which is, I think it was uh, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding out into time and space and told them to find a place. And, you know, the matter created this orb that was sort of hovering in time and space looking for a suitable place to create the earth, and he couldn't find it. And eventually it did, and it broke into two parts, and one part stayed in time and space, which I guess is, is the spiritual realm, and then the other part came down to heaven, and I think Obatala was supposed to come down with the bottom half, but he was drunk and- Too much palm wine. Yeah, and then Odudua came down instead, which is not how Odudua became the sort of- Founder of the, the Yoruba founder people. of the Yoruba race. And, you know, so we've got these pavilions that are audiovisual because Yoruba art isn't just visual, it's visual and it's, um, and verbal. You know, so the visual arts, the visual oriki works with the verbal oriki. So as you're looking at the art, you know, we, the orikis are coming through speakers. So it's a multi-sensory audiovisual experience. You know, so you've got it in Yoruba, maybe English subtitles, we still haven't decided. 
<laughs> you know, and, and so there'll be some text as well. There'll be some Braille as well. So that explains, so for example, this pavilion will explain that origin story. And then from there we go in, so there's the Orisha pavilion, which is next, which I think looks at 15 of the main, of the most prominent Orishas. So Shongo, Batala, Romila, um, or Shun, and mm -hmm. just demystifying, demystifying that. Um, so the video at the end will show you all of that. And then this, this, this picture is of the very last pavilion. So the five pavilions are the Creation Pavilion, uh, the um, Orisha, the um, Ileori, the Orisha Pavilion. Then there's a Customs and Practice, which looks at um, everyday life in the Yoruba Township before colonization. And then there's a Slavery Transition Area, which looks at you know, slavery and the sort of the export of uh, Yoruba language, Yoruba culture, you know, with slavery and how that still evolved because um, Yoruba culture is very progressive. It adapts, you know, to new environments, to times, you know, so that explains that. And then from there, it moves to the next pavilion, which focuses on the 20th century. And, and then we've looked at icons of the 20th century in, 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 in music, in theater, arts, government. So people like Awolo, Wole Shoinka, Fela Kuti, uh, Salawa Beni, Kola Gumola, um, from the 20th to the late 20th century, Lagbaja and so on. And then, we, and then the last section look is Ola, which looks at tomorrow, where we reimagine the Southwest. You know, so it's, you know, it's, 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 it's the contemporary scene. It's Lagos in 2245, might be underwater because um, <laughs> of all the flooding. <laughs> um, um, it might be, you know, it's just completely reimagined. So it's, a, you know, it's a series of VR setups, AR setups, um, um, cartoons, comics, videos, reimaginations of what the Southwest would have been if the colonizers never came or if the Orishas were roaming the earth, imagine issue just sort of strolling in surreal area, metering swift justice, you know, to anybody who misbehaved, you know, so just sort of looking at that in, 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 in the future. And, 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 and so that's, that's it. Yeah. That's uh, already a lot of uh, promise that yeah. uh, <laughs> you're making. So you, you said it would be uh, until next year. Yeah, we're but, hoping, uh, we're hoping second quarter next year. Okay, and can you just tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, institutions behind uh, the project? Who is supporting the project, and um, who is that has actually approached you to uh, to be part of yeah. the project? Yeah. Um, so the project was initiated by the Lagos State Government, which surprises a lot of people. Um, we were surprised as well. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's you know, I I have to, I have to say this. Um, Hats off to the Lagos State Government. They've, they've supported us, you know, 100% of the way. When, when I first started, you know, I had all these ideas. You know, so we want to do this. I'll go to the commissioner. So we want to do this. You know, I have this idea. You know, I don't want, I want to look at it. You know, philosophy, cosmology, da, da, da. And this guy's like a proper Yoruba guy, aging like guy. And he's just looking at me and listening to me and saying, what is this boy yanning? You know, and I'm saying, every time I say I want to do this, I'm thinking about that. He would just say, go, you know, go ahead. So I wanted to combine the sites. I want to landscape it. I want to put a green roof. And he's like, cool. Oh, I want, I want to hire some professors to write us a narrative. Yeah, go. You know, he says, okay, you can have one professor. And, you know, and I came back and I said, um, can I have four? You know, he says, yeah. I said, oh, by the way, it's, you know, two of the four at Wainbow. And he's like, Why? <laughs> and I'm like, because, and he's like, but I have to defend it. I was like, yeah, 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 but I really need them. He's like, can't you just get someone from Ife? And I was like, no, 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 I, I need these Oyibo guys. No offense, sorry. Money or Oyibo? You know, like, I need these Oyibo guys. And he's like, yeah, I don't get it, but yeah, fine, go. But I could still tell that he just wasn't sure. He's like, what is this boy cooking, you know, sort of thing, and... Even when, even when they met, you know, he was just kind of suspicious. Why are these Oyinbo guys here? You know, what do they know? What can they teach me that I don't know? And then obviously Will and the other guy did his thing, and they were all hugging at the end of the meeting, calling themselves brothers and whatever else. You know, so you know, they, they've, they've, been, they've been positive the entire, you know, the entire way. 
and and they trusted us with it and 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 um yeah i think i think we you know we will finish they see the value of what it is that we're doing culturally educationally uh the impact that it could possibly have you know on on on, on lagos even in terms of revenue you know we did them some projections that you know will make them loads of money you know so that helped um and but then we've had th that's the first time yeah. right that you get and we've had uh the british museum have been uh very 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 amazing uh, Will will speak about it later, but you know, just t uh, touching on restitution. You know, we have an agreement with the British Museum, you know, to have some of the works here. It's taken a few years, but you know, they've been they've been they've been very supportive. I think they've they've offered operation support uh, as well. The Ford Foundation uh, have offered their support. Google Digital have offered their support. They've offered to digitize uh, all our resource material for the online library. Um, the French government, actually, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you should clap for yourself, um, <laughs> or, you should, or you should clap for your government. Um, the 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 French ambassador to Nigeria came to the site, okay. yeah, and, and, he, and he, had, he had a walk around, and he was very impressed. And uh, so they offered their support as well, and and quite quite a few prominent Nigerians in the art space who've you know heard about what we've done. And who've come to the site and seen it, they've, excuse me, they've offered their support as well. So, yeah, it, uh, as I saw things since the beginning, this is a very inspiring project for all these different uh, angles that you've touched upon now. But uh, so now maybe turning to, uh, to you, Will. Yeah, Will's going to talk to you about content. the boring stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Will, you're, uh, you, you are a professor at the University of Leeds, right? Yes, yeah. I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm currently uh, teaching um, Africa at the School of Art History uh, at the University of Leeds. Great, and you're part of these four uh, uh, professors any, or any, any, any prospective PhD <laughs> students, there, there, there is the Focus, email. focus. <laughs> that okay. was the ad uh, moment. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, if you could okay. tell us through um, the... I, I, I was asked on Thursday to come down uh, by Shane. No excuses, Will. And so I have just put an old PowerPoint up. But I, the, one of the things is... Get on with it. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I, my involvement... Shane has been far too modest about JK. He's being his usual laid back, look, here it is, and so on. This project is central to the development of Lagos as a cultural center. It sits at the heart of a redevelopment of that city. In 2000, I did a conference uh, in Lagos, and I said, Lagos is the modern city of the world, and it is. Lagos is Paris of the 1890s. It's London of the 1860s. It's New York of the 1930s. That is what Lagos is now. It is where modernity, the modern, exists, okay? And I think that the JK Center is going to be absolutely at the heart of that. The, I was in Lagos in November, and the energy that the young people in Lagos are bringing into that place is just spectacular. And the issues that they are confronting are those that, you know, young people around the world are confronting, but... Mm, They've got it in Lagos, and they're, and they're working on it in spades. And JK is absolutely at the heart of a reculturalization, a rediscovery of culture. Okay, so Yoruba. My, <coughs> or Yiboso, why? Why am I here? Um, in part because I was born in Ibadan. I've always had a very, very strong uh, relationship. Many, many Yoruba uh, people uh, who used to come and stay in the house. Nigeria was, was sort of in the house the whole time. Africa was in our house. So I inevitably ended up traveling and going back. Um, but um, Yoruba has always been, you know, it, it, it sometimes you kind of go, why don't you go to Ghana? Everybody's wonderful in Ghana. It's really easy and everybody's greeting. But actually, the place that you want to be is in southwestern Nigeria because that's where culture development is really, really happening. It's where, it's where there's excitement in, 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 in things. So, um, but... Shayon then approached me. I've been teaching African art for 20, 25 years, and Shayon uh, approached me and a group of other profs to kind of talk about the way in which we might develop uh, 
the kind of program of cultural development in the JK. And it's, it's a very, very interesting, it's a very, very interesting project. How do you get this region into a single space? And one of the things about Yoruba culture is that it is very diverse. There's a whole series. Each village will say, ah, we are Yoruba culture, and it will be different from the village just down the road. So um, actually working out what this might be is, is, is one of the sort of issues that we're confronting um, in, in bringing, um, bringing JK in, into fruition. Um, and in a sense, the kind of question becomes rather not what is, is Yoruba culture, but when is Yoruba culture? The idea of time and, and, and time flowing from tradition and into the modern and into the future. So this sort of sense of bringing a flow that runs through that beautiful curvilinear building was very much part of our sort of project. So that we, we actually don't say that there was a Yoruba culture, and this is what Yoruba culture is. But Yoruba is always going forward, always moving, always changing. It's mutable. Okay, so yes, we bring the Orisha to, to, to presence. And one of the problems in some ways is that the Orisha are not necessarily iconic. So we have to kind of think through how we might make the Orisha real to... Uh, to, to a school party that's coming to visit, or a tourist who's coming from Brooklyn. How do we actually develop an idea of who and what these individual personalities are? And Shane has talked that, uh, through the idea that, well, you know, the god of thunder is, is you know, Thor, and maybe actually Shongu uh, is, is actually a better manifestation of that. So we're using all sorts of different types of imagery. Um, some of which, of course, draws upon the kind of imagery that, that you might find um, in, 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 any, in any museum, but also the kind of imagery that is actually also still in existence. So, Ia Shongo here, she scared me so much. She was such a powerful woman. Um, but you see, she is using the Oshe Shongo. Um, and then there's also the sort of whole problem and issue of color and symbolism and so on. Um, but also, some of the greatest works of art, uh, in my opinion, in, in the world, uh, are related to, to Shongo. Um, Eshu and Ifa, similarly, um, and, and so Obatala, who is actually only signified by white cloth. Um, but these traditions are still there, they are still being performed, and they are changing and mutating and becoming. So uh, my own work is very much related to um, masquerades, igungum, um, although I work in Ikiti, Ikole Ikiti, um, and their masquerade is called Igigum. Um, but we have the traditions of masquerade, but they are still very contemporary things. This masquerade, the name is Igigum Rasta. And I said, why is it Rasta? And you can see, he has dreadlocks. And that flag is the flag of the colors of Rastafari. So I asked the performer, why? Why, why do you call it Rasta? And he said, well, like Bob Marley, isn't it? You know? So it's kind of like, this is the way that traditions change. And we want to reflect that in JK. Of course, Yoruba heritage is deep. It goes a long way back, Ife. Um, you know, while, while, while medieval uh, Europe was still playing around with, 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 with mud uh, and, and very basic kind of artworks, the people of Ife were creating work in lost wax technology that was, I think, one of the most important traditions uh, in the world. Okay, this is, this is 14th, 13th, 14th century, and there was nothing in the world to compare with it at that time. Look at the detail, the delicacy of these sculptures. But of course, Yoruba also has a 19th century history. 
Okay? The making of Yoruba, the bringing of Yoruba together, was very reliant upon a standardized orthography, making the language work across the region. Um, and, of course, Bishop Ajay Crowther and Samuel Johnson are key figures in the development of that Yoruba identity. This idea of making a modern identity is something that JK absolutely sits within that tradition. Okay? This is making identity, bringing identity to bear. But we also have to remember that, that part of that identity is also about the colonial and bringing that colonial story into presence is also true. I have a problem with the idea that Western scholars now look at colonialism and they look at the spectacle and the gaze of the colonist and so on. My interest is, is well, who's looking back? You know, so this, this sculpture here is by uh, a carver in Abiyakuta, 1923. It's of the colonial officer in Abiyakuta. It's an image looking back. As my mentor, Professor Adi Ajay, said, colonialism is only one small part of the history of Africa, okay? And we must just take it as being one small part of the history of Africa. But, of course, that colonialism led to some very interesting products, and it led to some of those products being placed in museums in the UK. So this is the Olowe door that you can all go and see at the British Museum. We're getting this stuff, by the way. We are, we are going to, to, we're asking for it. We're getting it. Um, <laughs> we're, we're working. Um, we're getting it's, it. It's, it's Captain, Captain Ambrose visiting the Ogogo Vikere. Okay, 1924, it came over to the British Museum and was used as the central piece in the timber exhibit. It wasn't art, it was technology. Okay. Now, of course, we see it as one of the finest works of art in the British Museum, okay? and we want it. We're getting it. But these Yoruba carvers, one of the things is that one of the things we really need to display is the um, the names of carvers. Too often, African art is regarded as anonymous, as having no name, as as there being nobody. But actually, even in the small area of Ikiti that I work in, you can see that there are a whole series, Ariogu, Aguna, Oloe, Agbonbiofe, Ologunde, Obefon. These are all known people. They might not be known to art historians in the West, Bamboye. but there's a Riki are there. Bamboye. Bamboye. They're all there. So um, we, 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 we can see the individual hands, the styles. These are known carvers, just as Picasso and Mondrian are known in the West, so in Africa we need to know the histories and the stories of the individuals. Yeah, sorry, can I, can I just come in there quickly? Um, one of the things that I find you know, to be a problem is there seems to be a gap between, I mean we're, talk, we're looking at 14th to 19th century art and the quality of craftsmanship and detail is just amazing. But if you go to Lagos now, it's all contemporary art. You know, it's all, you know, with their own narratives. There's, there's no precedent studies. There's no links to the history. Um, I went, and so one of the things we want to do at the center is, you know, like Will said, shine a light on these guys and, then, and, 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 and show the history, the quality of this art that started in the, 19, uh, in the, in, in the 14th century. And then also try and creates those linkages as well. So there's, there's a carver called Lamidi Fakir. I don't know if you've got his work here, but I think he was prominent in, I think, the 1920s. Um, his grandson works at the National Theatre, carving in the same style. You know, and, and, and these are the sorts of linkages uh, that we should make, and, 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 and this sort of crafts where it should be celebrated, taught in schools and whatever else. You know, but the guy's just there in a corner you know, and only those who know of his lineage understand the quality of work that he's doing, you know, but he's just there because he can't get into art house or any contemporary um, museum or auction or exhibition. I think one of the, one of the projects that we, we're developing with this fabulous space is to kind of reimagine what uh, the lineaments of a Yoruba heritage might be. This is my friend Sam Aloriwaju, 
who's carving um, this, these were slides from 1990, but I'm going to kind of finish there but, um, so that we can open up into a wider discussion. But what I'm saying is that actually um, bringing that idea of a Yoruba culture, there is no one singular Yoruba culture, except there is, of course, a Yoruba identity. But bringing that sort of multiple facets into a singular space within the center of Lagos is really, really exciting. This is one of the first times that the idea of heritage, both the tangible heritage, but also, importantly, the intangible heritage of Yoruba culture can actually be placed in the sort of center of that Lagos uh, 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 cultural quarter um, as, as a, a kind of holding place. Um, it will encourage the museum, the National Museum next door, uh, which has some of the most wonderful works of art uh, in, in Africa, sitting in storage, just doing nothing. It, the, the, the JK has already stimulated a huge amount of interest and development over that museum site. It's already started to look at places like Benin. So if we talk about uh, the return of cultural properties um, Benin, are now, uh, Benin City is now looking at building a dedicated museum so that the British Museum have no excuse around the return of the bronzes. Um, and there's just this sort of generation of interest. And it has to be said that the British Museum are pretty keen. Yeah, fair play, you know, fair they, play to they, the British they, Museum. They, they, are, they are working yeah. within the agenda. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've, they've taken a beating, you know, over, you know, I think in the last year over this restitution um, uh, matter, which maybe that's why they've been so nice to us. Um, but yeah, you know, it's been good. But also, I think yesterday uh, during Papa's talk, you know, there was a lot of conversation about building systems, you know, building institutions, you know, in, 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 in our side of the world. And um, so that's part of what we're trying to do. And, and the, more of us need to do it because if you take this um, reparations restitution uh, discussion, it's very emotive. You know, everybody says, oh, we want our stuff, we need our stuff, give it back. You know, you took it without asking, you know, whatever else. Um, but I think the British Museum has, what, 11,000? Yeah, the British Museum's got 11,000 uh, artifacts. I would say about 4,000 are probably high quality. Yeah. Um, the National Museum has 48,000 in storage. It's not just on display, it's in just storage. In storage, forty-eight thousand. Know, They've got mattresses works. on it. It's people are just sort of lying down, sleeping on it. You know, I mean, yeah. it's it's for the the, the uh, archive at the National Museum. I've spent thirty years trying to visit the archive of the National Museum, and they're very worried about the security. And for the first time in November, I walked in, and I said, "Okay." just bring my tent because I'm staying here for the next two years, yeah. okay? The amount of work that is just in storage in the National Museum. And in many ways, the issue of colonial reparation, which I think has to be recognized, yeah. but it's about building those institutions yeah, it has to be back exchange. again. It has to be done in partnership, but building those. So even to the extent of looking at the archives, so we think about the material objects, but what about the things that are written? So the archives in the National Museum, you go to a filing box, which is some kind of takes about five days to get in and to work through the bureaucracy. But you go to the archive, and you pick the paper out, and it falls apart in your hands, OK? Because it's not been stored in proper condition. So these are the kind of issues. But it's only through building these sorts of cultural institutions that we can actually interact with and push the state um, to understand the importance of this cultural heritage. Yeah. And, it's, and it's happening now because I mean, when we started, the National Museum saw us as enemies. You know, we're across the street and we're building this shiny new thing which is going to take away their traffic. And so we spent the last year just kind of trying to appease them because the bulk of what um, we're looking to display we actually want to get from them and the British Museum and so 
over the last year, they've actually seen that you know there's there's a benefit to actually joining us and networking, and you know obviously we're trying to get grants to help them with their documentation, digitization, and whatever else. And so even even in even in the last year, you know the the, the mindset has changed. It's you know it's a lot more positive now. And even they're willing willing us on, you know because we're trying to work out programs where we can divert some of the traffic that would come to this center to to the yeah to the national museum and trying to work out ways to uh, renovate the national museum as well so that you know it becomes a sort of you know there's a two part relationship between the historical museum and you know what we're doing which is more of a cultural center as opposed to as opposed to a standalone museum and, uh, and you mentioned also that uh, you were also exploring other partnership with yes, yes, yes. other cultural <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. I mean, location. there's some other private museums coming up, mm -hmm. uh, the Prince Chillon Museum, and there's a the Lagos State Museum coming up. You know, mm -hmm. so we are having conversations, you know, privately, mm -hmm. you know, the architects, the curators, just trying to create, you know, network synergies. Um, we're talking to the guys who run Freedom Park. So Freedom Park... Uh, it's, it's, it's this nice park. So they've been to the site. We've had we've had a few meetings, you know, with them where we're just trying to create, you know, these networks. So we're not we're not competing. We're actually, you know, we're actually sort of networking and, and working together to to create this cultural quarter. In, and this in, community. In, yeah, this uh, community in Lagos yeah, Island. Project, exactly. Yeah. So just one last question before we open to the. To yeah, the we have a video. Can we? Can we? Oh yeah. Can we? That's true. Yeah line up the video there's a video that sort of summarizes everything it's about six minutes long um and i think once we've, once we've seen the video That's then